I have to talk with Janos. I wonder if he knows that his great hero, Vlad Tepesh, served as the model for Dracula, the vampire. Hello, Janos. I have a surprise for you. I've just been ordered to conduct an investigation into vampires. What do you know? Anything can happen. I was talking about the same subject with Stefan Luca, who just arrived at the inn. He's kind of a fanatic, and firmly believes in the existence of vampires. You should question him. You're more useful to me because you're a historian. I have several questions to ask you, particularly about Vlad Tepesh. The recognized expert on the subject was Professor Van Bergen. The great Orientalist. The man who crisscrossed Asia for the English Secret Service? The very one. At his death, his superb collection was bequeathed to his successor, Professor Irina Buxa. Speak about her to Stefan Luca. I think he has her number. So Professor Boxoff would be the person to consult? Without a doubt. She possesses remarkable pieces on the subject you are interested in. A manuscript of a biography of Vlad Tepesh, in particular. Good. I shall get in touch with her. That's a legend forged by his enemies. Stoker was inspired by it to write a very bad novel. It's a journey of initiation that some traditions associate with Vlad Tepesh. Most likely because Vlad was called Dracula, which means the dragon or the devil. But it's more related to occultism than to history. Professor Bokzov will fill you in better than I can. I assume she took some of your blood? She gets everybody to contribute. These ruins are impressive, aren't they? Imagine this edifice before the war, when the erect ramparts had been standing for centuries. Father, we have to follow the path of the dragon. Let's go to Turkey. Since Martha went there, t together we'll succeed. I don't think that my superiors would appreciate that initiative. However, I promise that I'll think about it. Irina Buxov? I tried to contact her, but I was rejected. She's incredibly mistrustful. It's a shame. Because I, I I think she knows a great deal about the Path of the Dragon. Do you have her phone number? Who knows, maybe I'll be luckier than you. Do you think so? 
Possibly you're a priest. That inspires trust. Call 445-827 in Budapest. But whatever you do, don't say you know me. One day, I, I found her in a state of shock. She wouldn't tell me anything, but I understood that she had been threatened. I told her she was taking too many risks. She wasn't listening to me, so I got angry. She answered that she'd do without my help, and she never spoke to me again about the path. It was stupid of me. If I'd backed her up all the way, she might still be alive. Today, it's my duty to finish what she began. Alone, if you won't help me. Martha said it was the only way to discover objects and symbols related to each trial. She added that without that knowledge, it was impossible to attain the end of the path. She haunted public and private libraries. I know that she frequently visited the Alba Iula Museum. It burned shortly after her death. I have a feeling it wasn't by accident. I went to give blood at the request of Dr. Maria Florescu. You didn't try to recover any documents? What's the point in harassing young Maria? I'm sure there's nothing left of Martha's archives. Our enemy has had plenty of time to destroy them. Father, help me resume the task that Martha began. With a priest at my side, I'd feel stronger. It's not so simple. You see, this affair is really not in my purview. Number, please. This is Arena Boxoff. This is Father Arno Moriani. Hello, Professor. At the request of my hierarchy, I'm investigating the persistence of certain superstitions. You are an authority on questions of folklore and popular beliefs. You flatter me. Let's say that I've had the good fortune to inherit the library of my predecessor, Professor Hermann von Bergen. But tell me, what exactly is your investigation focused on? The belief in those imaginary creatures called... vampires. Vampires? You're interested in vampires? Just to demystify them, the Catholic Church wants to fight this superstition. Hmm. I have serious reserves about getting into the subject. I am in great demand, you know. Could you be more precise about the framework in which you're conducting your inquiry? I was entrusted with it by Monsignor Felicio Briganti of the Congregation of Rites. If need be, you can contact him by calling Vatican 63. Your references are serious. I'll accept to help you, Father, but I don't trust the telephone. Could you visit me at my office in Budapest? Certainly. As early as tomorrow, if it's all right with you. Very good. I'll expect you. Oh, I forgot. I was told that you possess a volume related to my inquiry. A biography of Vlad Tepesh? That's true. Professor von Bergen left me Michel Beheim's account in verse. It's a 15th century manuscript, very precious. But did you know that the German prose version was reprinted in 1905? It's a brochure entitled Geschichte Dracona Vida, brought out by the Friends of the Vatican Library. Published by the Friends of the Vatican Library? In that case, it won't be difficult for me to procure a copy. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye, Father. Number, please. This is Cardinal Felicio Briganti. This is Father Arno Moriani. I intend to go have a discussion with Professor Irina Boxoff in Budapest to complete my file on vampires. Very good. 
will you be coming back to Rome directly afterwards? If you don't see any problem with it, I'll go back to Vladiviste first. I'll be more tranquil there to write up my conclusions. Ah, an excellent idea. You'll be able to take advantage of the fresh country air. <laughs> I also plan on spending a week or two in the country. I almost forgot. Could you have a work that was published by the Friends of the Vatican Library sent to me? Certainly. It's a bound volume, Geschichte Dracula Vida, reprinted in 1905. No problem. I'll send it to you at your inn. Let me insist on one point, Arno. For your research, it's important that you consult the best scientific experts. We need the authority of a doctor and a historian to support your conclusions. I understand. And after you've finished your work, make sure you get some rest. Goodbye, Your Eminence. Be well, Arno. Number, please. Alba Eula, put me through to Germany. Unit 321941. This is Professor Heinrich von Kruger. This is Father Arno Moriani. Professor, I'm calling back to ask for your help. Hmm. How can I help you? Well, it's rather delicate to explain. You should know, first of all, that I belong to the Holy Congregation of Rites. I came to Vladiviste to investigate the life of Martha Caligaro. Would you like me to talk to you about her? She was a remarkable woman. To tell the truth, my mission has changed. For reasons that would be a little long to explain, I now have to investigate vampires. Vampires? <laughs> Don't tell me. The Catholic Church has started to believe in vampires. <laughs> On the contrary, my superiors want to combat this belief. They're alarmed to see how resistant it still is in the 20th century. Ah, yeah, very good. If it's to fight superstition, you can count on my assistance. It will be invaluable to me, for I need the viewpoint of a scientist on the vampire myth. Do you realize this is the very subject of the research I was carrying out with Dr. Kalugaro? We discovered a disease, the P-syndrome, whose symptoms are quite similar to those attributed to the victims of vampires. So the legend is based on specific medical facts. Dr. Kalugaro contacted me when she was caring for a patient called Marescu. His granulocytes showed a very curious anomaly. She sent me a blood sample by carrier pigeon, and we worked on this case together. The result of our collaboration was the discovery of P syndrome. Afterwards, we had to specify the cause of the disease and perfect the serum. For that, I needed statistical data. I asked Dr. Caligaro to take a large number of samples from the population of Vladiviste. Unfortunately, the war interrupted our research. Did you pick up again with Martha Caligaro after the end of the hostilities? It was impossible for me to contact her immediately. When I was finally able to phone the dispensary, she was dead. It was Dr. Florescu who answered me. Of course. I've been insisting for some time now that she do so. As soon as she sends me the results I'm missing, I'll be able to find a serum that's effective against P syndrome. I just say that they're not supernatural creatures, but there certainly do exist mentally ill people who are bloodthirsty. Look at Countess Elizabeth Batori, who in the 16th century bled to death hundreds of young girls before she was walled up alive in her Carpathian castle. In addition, as I mentioned, Patients afflicted with the P syndrome suffer from very odd physical and psychological disorders that make them resemble the victims of vampires. Oh, what did these patients do? They went out alone in the night, as if they were answering a call. They ripped off the garlic necklaces the doctor had placed on them. Somnambulism, allergy to garlic. Those signs are most likely associated with P syndrome, as are pallor, drawn features, anemia, and other symptoms we haven't yet discovered. 
Unfortunately, yes. What an abominable novel. You're too severe. That's not what Oscar Wilde thought. I won't tell you what I think of Oscar Wilde, and I limit myself to the novel. It's a tissue of inconsistencies. Let's see. Stoker affirms that those who die as victims of a vampire should become one in turn. So at that rate, vampirism should spread like an epidemic, with a growth rate faster than Fibonacci's famous immortal sequence. In a first stage, all of mankind would be vampirized, and then, in a second, the vampires would also disappear, not having any victims left to feed on. So, Stoker's hypothesis is therefore perfectly absurd. No species can live without regulation. Stoker considers himself a historian and a scientist, but he's just an oddball. His novel is a collection of implausibilities. Take the character of Lucy. That woman, he keeps saying, is getting better until she just dies. A victim of Dracula, she's treated by transfusion. Blindly, of course, because at the time, we knew nothing of blood types. In those conditions, what are the chances the patient will accept the donor's blood? About one out of three, if my recollections are good. Nonetheless, in desperate cases, it's worth the trouble to try. Certainly. But the good Professor Van Helsing, who is always described as a genius, repeated the operation with four different donors. The chances of survival for that poor Lucy then fell to less than 2%. It's probably the transfusion that killed her, and not Dracula. Let's get back to Van Helsing, supposedly an expert on vampires. He teaches them that they can read minds and change into bats. However, he's not worried about finding one of the latter at the window of the room in which he's holding a meeting. And then he seems so surprised that Dracula knows his plan. <laughs> the naivety of that character is irritating. Yeah, I know the work of now. They call it expressionism. But for me, those morbid fantasies have much more to do with pathology. Tell me, could I ask you a personal question? Listening to your voice, I have the feeling that you're a little tense. Yes, I'm not sleeping well. Nothing else? You can confide in me. I'm a doctor, you know. Well, sometimes I get the feeling I'm being spied upon. I'm sure it's only an impression, but it's becoming an obsession. Father Arno, you are sensitive and susceptible, like our late lamented Dr. Caligaro. These are qualities, but they make you vulnerable. Above all, don't let your imagination govern you. That's good advice. Thank you. I'll try to follow it. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye, Father. He used to correspond regularly with Martha before the war. He didn't believe in vampires. According to him, the victims were sick people who needed to be cured. Martha shared his opinion at the beginning. It was during the war that she understood the truth. Father, help me resume the task that Martha began. With a priest at my side, I'd feel stronger. It's not so simple. You see, this affair is really not in my purview. Ozana, I'm leaving for Budapest for a day or two. Would you please keep my room? Well, that is... Naturally, I'll pay you for my keep, even for the nights that I'm not here. In that case, of course, Father. I'll keep your room for you. Luana. Certain things, but I also know the virtues of silence. 
as much as I want to know. I have a feeling that before the end you will know more than me about the dragon. You are an outsider like me. Beware of the people of this village. Father Arno, I presume? You didn't have too much difficulty finding my office? No. The concierge told me what I needed to know. You have a wonderful place. All the art objects surrounding me were bequeathed by my mentor and friend, the late Professor Hermann von Bergen. I know his reputation. He was a great traveler. And a distinguished scholar. But tell me, did you have a pleasant journey? Yes, thank you. I admired the Transylvanian landscape, then I fell asleep. And you've come from Transylvania? From Vladiviste, to be precise. The homeland of Vlad the Impaler. You made the right choice of locales to investigate vampires. Herman went there too when he was young. He never told me. I've had various hypotheses, of course, but I must confess, the question intrigues me and to think that the answer might lie behind you. The personal papers of Herman are in this strong box. He died suddenly and didn't have the time to give me the code for opening it. Can I try to open it? I'm no expert in the matter, but with a little luck. Gladly. I'd be very grateful if you managed to open Herman's strong box. This lock is incredibly noisy. Or has my ear become more sensitive? I can't get over how clearly I can hear the mechanism. It's extraordinary. I found the combination, M-D-C-C-C-X-X. -X. Looks like a number in Roman numerals. Thank you for opening the strong box, Father. Would you be so kind as to deposit the contents on my desk? A wax cylinder and a letter. Let's see the letter. Interesting. Are you familiar with the name of Bram Stoker? He's the author of Dracula. 
I had the opportunity of perusing his novel. This is a letter from Mr. Stoker addressed to Herman. Read it, please. Without this catalog associating each book with its call number, I'd be lost in my own library. It's a composite recurve bow, a lovely item, is it not? Capable, apparently, of piercing armor at 200 meters. That's a powerful weapon. But also a very handsome object. Herman brought it back from his travels in Central Asia. It's a container of acid. If anyone tries to force the strong box, it breaks and destroys everything within it. So then, Stoker was inspired by a story told him by Professor von Bergen, the story of events that had taken place in Transylvania. Perhaps in Vladoviste? It's probable. Did you know that Professor Van Bergen knew Bram Stoker? Yes, but I ignored all the details that are recounted in this letter. I only knew that Stoker had cited Herman among the sources inspiring him, and Herman was not flattered. Had the professor foreseen the novel's success? In no way. One day he told me, speaking of Stoker, that irresponsible man didn't understand half of what I told him. He's peddling errors that could cost people their lives. Fortunately, his book will be quickly forgotten. The first trace we have stems from ancient Babylon. The creation poem contains sinister allusions to Lilith, the unappeasable, who sucks the blood of newborns. Several centuries later, the Odyssey evokes dead people who crowd together to drink at a blood-filled ditch. But it's in Europe, beginning in the 14th century, that veritable epidemics of vampirism are described. They would continue until the 18th century, a period which left us much written testimony. For example? The famous Visum and Repertum report, written in 1732 by a retired Austrian military doctor. In it, we learn in abundant detail how Serbian peasants open a vampire's grave and execute him by driving a stake through his heart. Hmm, 
What an energetic method. It's very widespread. In Russia, they use an aspen stake. In other places, it's made of hawthorn, from which Christ's crown of thorns was woven. It has to. Reports describe hundreds of grave openings. The vampire's cadaver is identifiable because it's perfectly conserved. It often appears swollen by the blood it has absorbed. The blood stains its clothes, its nails, or its mouth. It's sometimes so abundant that it overflows the coffin. What do you mean by believe, Father? I mean, do you think that vampires have a real, objective existence? Real or objective? You must choose, Father. Because the only immediate reality is subjective. The rest are just hypotheses. All right, your viewpoint is unassailable. So let me reformulate my question. According to you, has the existence of vampires been demonstrated? Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, If ever there was in the world a warranted and proven history, it is that of vampires. Nothing is lacking. Official reports, affidavits of well-known people, of surgeons, of priests, of magistrates. The evidence is most complete. Yet all these stories and affidavits seem very confused to me. I sense nothing coherent behind it all. Didn't you say yourself that the traditions don't agree? Don't take the legends literally. I think they are the deformed reflection of a truth that is even more horrible. This book, The Lords of Twilight, is the most rigorous volume ever written on vampires. Open it. The Lords of Twilight is the work of an insane person. It's sheer madness. Father, the war that has just ended shows that the whole world can go mad. In less than 30 years, evil will seize power and the earth will once more catch fire. No, not so quickly, not so soon. After the carnage we went through, the world will take the time to let its wounds heal. You'll see. The author of the book the Thule Society that publishes it, all of them are criminals who won't hesitate trampling on corpses to gain power and eternal life. The war will come because of them and their like. That's very possible. 
Vlad was a cruel ruler, intelligent and determined. He could very well have made a deal with the devil and conquered immortality. So he would have lived several centuries? To be sure. But where would he be hiding? In Vladiviste? Why not? Or elsewhere. The fox might have changed his den. The only way to tell would be to follow the path until its end. It's a group founded by Heinrich von Kreuzberg on the ruins of the Golden Dawn, another secret society. Thule reached out to Professor von Bergen many times, but he couldn't bear them. He always kept his distance, and I followed his example. Did they approach you? Many times. Openly, then in any roundabout way. Oh, they're very clever, very influential. I would never compromise myself with them. Do you know the hidden apocalypse of Thomas the Greater? Yes. There are those who say it is a prophetic work. Here it is. Open the book and you will read some astonishing things. This page reveals the origin of the Great War. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo. The event that would submerge the world in horror had been announced centuries before in this book. Really? This page, you say? Forget the direction you ordinarily read in. Try to compose words vertically or diagonally. See? Passus belli. The cause of the war. Exactly. The prophecy contains two other terms that cross the first one. Look for them, and you will find the date and place of the assassination. Are you giving up? Do I have to show you the words that you haven't found? Everything's there. In 1914, in Sarajevo, the incident that caused the war occurred. It can't be a coincidence. It's very odd, I grant you that. That's the past. Now let's discover the future. You see, on this page, the Thule Society is clearly designated. Its name is associated with Caiadis, which means massacre. To know more, look for connected terms. Are you giving up? Do I have to show you the words that you haven't found? So now everything is clear. At the instigation of the Thule Society, evil will triumph in Germany in 1936, and there will be massacres. So this prophecy is at the root of your mistrust of the Thule Society? It's just one element among many others. Believe me, those people have no notion of compassion. I won't examine this document without permission. I see it as a way to force destiny to attain, thanks to the force, spheres forbidden to man. How could that be possible? Father, you are well placed to know that sacraments of good exist. You must accept that there are also sacraments of evil, handed down from time immemorial. If they do exist, these sacraments can only be dangerous illusions. They do exist. Seven of them. Seven stages of the same route. Seven trials to change a man into a bloodthirsty monster who pretends to deal with God as an equal. 
The keys to the path of the dragon are hidden in ancient documents. Take this occult work. It contains an illustration that I would ask you to examine carefully. I know that painting. I saw it very recently. It's Raphael's crucifixion scene. Although, no, it's not precisely the same work. Excellent memory. It is indeed a copy. We shall point out the differences with the original one by one. In the original painting, the angel on the left holds two chalices. To be sure, I remember that very well. In your copy, the angel on the left is only holding one chalice. Absolutely. That's the most flagrant difference. There's another one, but you'll need a magnifying glass to see it. Focus your magnifying glass on the base of the cross. An inscription, but it's in ancient Enochian. Um, do not let your blood flow in vain. A strange locution. What meaning do you ascribe to all this? Herman had an idea on the subject. These variations between the two versions of the crucifixion are troubling. You say that Professor Van Bergen was able to interpret them? Herman was convinced that the variations in the documents revealed the secrets of the path. Imagine yourself as a copyist, seeking to transmit a message to initiates. Two methods are possible. Either you add an element to the original, or more subtly, you remove one. The chalice? Yes. It's absent from the copy, and I think it's a way to draw attention to it. The devil leaves his signature in its absence, Herman said. Then the chalice is important. An object is associated with each stage of the path. I'd venture a guess that the chalice is one of them. There are six others to discover. What happens at the end of the route? The initiate must accomplish one last rite. He won't be able to unless he's understood all he's achieved before. That is, if he knows the order of the trials as well as the objects and symbols related to each of them. If you want to transmit forbidden knowledge, it's an advantage to plagiarize sacred art. Your copy will be piously conserved by simple folk who don't even suspect what you've hidden there and your message will go through the centuries, understood only by those to whom it is addressed, your spiritual brothers, the Initiates. That's true, but it's very hard to find one's way in it. Herman had a very particular way of storing his books. Let's say he classified them more poetically than functionally. Without this catalog associating each book with its call number, I'd be lost in my own library. Every time I take a volume from the shelf, I write its call number on a bookmark I slip between the pages. 
That way I can put it back in place without losing too much time. For the same reason, I use ghosts. Ghosts? Yes, there are ghosts in my library. That's what we call the pieces of white cardboard that signify the place of a missing work on the shelf. Professor, I don't want to take up too much of your time. This visit was most interesting, even if, I must admit, your opinions hardly go in the sense my hierarchy expected. It's regrettable that the Catholic Church is so rigid. But even if the existence of vampires may be doubted, the existence of the Thule Society is unquestionable. Beware of it, Father. I'll gather some documents that will show you all of the malevolence of this organization. Where can I send them to you? At the Vladovista Inn, if you'd be so kind. Thank you for receiving me so graciously, Professor. I wish you a safe journey back to Transylvania, Father. I'll keep you. What an astonishing conversation. It's as if this woman lived in another world. I'll have to test some of these arguments on Professor Kruger. I'm curious to know his opinion. got to see Janos and Stefan. I'll surely be curious to know how my conversation with Professor Boxhoff went. But first, let's stop at the inn to see if I've received any mail. That's the outbox for the mail. <whistles> Stefan Luca is in the parlor. Let's go greet him. Hello, Father Arno. What news? I've just come from Budapest. I saw Professor Boxhoff, and I have to confess that she shares some of your ideas. You see? Are you ready to help me at last? When do we leave for Turkey? I don't think that my superiors would appreciate that initiative. However, I promise that I'll think about it. Very well. I think I'll have to venture onto the path of the dragon alone. I can see that I haven't convinced you, Father. But I'd still like to ask you something. Sometimes I'm scared, you know, scared of the powers I'm challenging. Of course, I do have my Medal of Saint Dimitri, but I'd also like to have your blessing. You should know that, at our hostess's request, I've already blessed the room you're sleeping in. Oh? Well, that is reassuring. Thank you, Father. Number, please. This is Professor Heinrich von Kruger. 
This is Father Arno Moriani. That hypersensitivity might be due to fatigue or to nervous tension. Let's see. You don't have any allergies, do you? No, not at all. Good. Well, I, I don't think there's anything to worry about, but call me if you notice any allergic reactions. Yeah, I noticed they coincided with epidemics of the plague. Masses of people died, they were buried quickly, and sometimes when they were still alive, they tore at themselves while trying to escape their coffins. If they were disinterred, their bodies were found bloodied. In short, they made perfect vampires. Cases of premature burial like that aren't uncommon, you know. Even today, a colleague told me of a pregnant woman who gave birth in her coffin. The poor lady died of suffocation with her child. Decomposition is not a very systematic phenomenon. If the laws of nature permit one out of a hundred bodies to deteriorate more slowly than others, take the time to open every grave in the cemetery, and you'll always find one pseudo-vampire. Anyway, why associate the absence of decomposition with vampirism? The phenomenon has, has been observed with many holy figures. For example, Francis Xavier and Teresa of Avila. This I just too. Explore the archives of your congregation, and you'll find dozens of cases. Decomposition produces gases that can give the cadaver a swollen aspect. The liquid that oozes from corpses is an odd phenomenon. But did you know that the venerable Lebanese monk Charbel Maklouf has sweat liters of blood since his death? Does that mean this holy man is a vampire? <laughs> what a pompous name. What does it refer to? An initiatory journey having to do with vampirism. Professor Arena Boxoff takes it very seriously. Himmel, esotericism, secret societies, initiatory journeys. What an old-fashioned hodgepodge. But even the greatest minds sometimes go astray. Himmel, esotericism, secret societies, initiatory journeys. What an old-fashioned hodgepodge. But even the greatest minds sometimes go astray. Prophecies. <laughs> what exactly did the professor say? Great evil will come forth in Germany in some 15 years. There will be massacres and a new world war. And what is the source of these prophecies? The Hidden Apocalypse of Thomas the Greater. Ah, yeah, the Kabbalistic version. Do you know it? <laughs> of course. I also amused myself when I was a student with associations of letters. By the virtue of the law of numbers, once in a while, you obviously have to find a combination that makes sense. You think that all of this is just coincidence? Yeah, and that that book can be made to say just about anything. Uh, wait a minute. I'll go get my copy. Let's open it at random to page three, for example, and look for significant words. You'll see that, with a little bit of luck, we're going to discover some wonders. Hey, look, it didn't take me long to find something. I see other words, but I'll leave you the pleasure of the hunt. Should I show you the words you didn't see? Good fishing, huh? But that's as it should be. When you look for just any old thing, you'll find it easily. Now, let's look at the interpretation. Rising sun, 1945. Fire from the sky. I've got a wealth of choices. For example, I can posit that 1945 will be the dawn of a new empire and that its advent will be accompanied by lightning bolts zigzagging through the sky. Or, also, that in 1945, heaven's fire will fall upon the empire of the rising sun, 
or any old ingenious absurdities that I can dream up. All right, this game is amusing but sterile. Let's focus our attention on other matters. If I can shed any light on them for you. Here it is. In Vladoviste, I met a gypsy who played both cards and dice. Can you describe the games to me? Methodically list every case, and you'll see that the best strategy is to bet on the visible color. That choice gives you two out of three chances to win. Your gypsy doesn't cheat. But she knows the probability, and that's how she wins against those who don't know it. Ah, this game is a probabilistic version of the classic rock-scissors-paper. It's clear that the white die has four chances out of six to beat the yellow one. We could even show that, in general, yellow beats black and black beats white. To improve your chances... Let your gypsy choose first, then take the die that beats hers. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye, Father. A package from the Vatican. It must be Vlad Tepesh's biography that Monsignor Briganti sent me.
Hello, Father Arno. Are you back from Budapest? Yes. I spoke at length with Professor Boxoff. She takes testimony about vampirism very seriously. Age makes many academics lose touch with reality. But tell me, did she show you the manuscript about Vlad Tepesh? It wasn't necessary. I was able to procure a printed edition, which is more than enough for my needs. You know I'm not very interested in esotericism. Vlad was reproached for everything, even for having abjured orthodoxy to convert to Catholicism. But his life is only known through the writings of his enemies. You have to read between the lines. Among other things, it's said that one Easter he treacherously seized all the noblemen in his country. They add that he made them labor naked on the enlargement of his castle till they died of exhaustion. But they omit to point out that these noblemen had betrayed all the previous kings. They were leading the country to its ruin through constant plotting. By eliminating them, Vlad was acting for the best. That's one view of things. All right, the time has come to call Monsignor Briganti to tell him my investigation is nearing its end. I hope he's in his office. How lucky you are. It's a very beautiful city. Really? That's fascinating. I suppose so. But my work is to show that everything can be explained with no mystery being involved. So then the Vatican doesn't want to believe in vampires. <laughs> what a lack of imagination. Oh, it's very kind of you to visit me, Father. Sir! Oh, Saint Martha, protect us. Excuse me? Nothing, no, nothing, Father. You were talking about the castle? Well, with all due respect, there's nobody left up there. And it's all demolished, so I don't go there. Legends. 
Remains to be seen if it's legends. Uh, could be you'll find some who'll talk to you about it. Maybe. I'd rather not talk about all that. So, you come to pray, Ozana? Yes, Father. I am praying to our Martha for business to take off again after these dark years. See, Father, the war ruined lots of small businesses. So would it be good for Vladiviste if Martha became a saint with a pilgrimage and the whole thing? Father, now about Martha, I've got to tell you something. My sister-in-law caught that chest disease. It was just before Dr. Ferescu arrived. There wasn't no doc in the village. Well, my sister-in-law touched a scarf Martha'd worn, and she was cured just like that. You see, Father... The war ruined lots of small businesses. So would it be good for Vladiviste if Martha became a saint with a pilgrimage and the whole thing? Father, now about Martha, I've got to tell you something. My sister-in-law caught that chest disease. It was just before Dr. Ferescu arrived. There wasn't no doc in the village. Well, my sister-in-law touched a scarf Martha'd worn and she was cured just like that. You see, Father, the war ruined lots of small businesses. Father, uh, now about Martha, I've got... You know. I saw you throw your discs. You're quite good. Yes, I'm very good. But since Ariel left, I have no one left to play with. Oh, can two play that? Of course. There are different rules, but what I prefer is playing against the wall. Explain it to me. Each player throws his disc. The one who arrives the closest to the wall without touching it wins the point. The first one to get two points wins the game. And if you hit the wall? That's bad luck. You lose the point immediately even if the other guy hasn't played yet. Oh, then the one who plays second has an advantage. For sure. That's why we draw lots the first time. Then it's always the winner of the previous point who starts.
Each player throws his disc. The one who arrives the closest to the wall without touching it wins the point. The first one to get two points wins the game. And if you hit the wall? That's bad luck. You lose the point immediately, even if the other guy hasn't played yet. Oh, then the one who plays second has an advantage. For sure. That's why we draw lots the first time. Then it's always the winner of the previous point who starts. Now the bridge is broken and you can't get in anymore. Except through the underground passages. But I don't know where they are. And you really have to be careful about ghosts. Ghosts? Yes. You can hear them crying at night. Ariel even saw them. Naked men carrying rocks to build a wall. Women and children too, stuck on stakes. I know one. He's very tall and walks in silence. I saw him through the fog near the tomb of the wild rose and at the crossroads of the broken oak. But it's funny you should ask me that question. Usually grown-ups don't like to talk about those things. Why do you think that's so? I think the grown-ups are scared. And you're not scared? No. Martha protects me. You're the one who doesn't look good, Father. You're so pale. Do you want to? Great! But usually grown-ups aren't interested in playing discs. They should be. It's a fine game. Shall we draw lots to see who starts? No, no. Since I know the game so well, it's best for me to start. That'll give you a little advantage. Hey, not bad. Oh, you're not going to finish the game? I keep all my treasures in this bag. Maybe I'll show them to you someday. One. That's normal. I've got a lot of practice. I keep all my treasures in this bag. Maybe I'll show them to you someday. like the discs are the same distance from the wall. Let's play the point over. You lost again. But don't worry. I'm sure that with a little practice you're going to win. I keep all my treasures in this bag. Maybe I'll show them to you someday. Hmm, 
Looks like the discs are the same distance from the wall. Let's play the point over. Hmm. Looks like the discs are the same distance from the wall. Let's play the point over. Hmm. Looks like the discs are the same distance from the wall. Let's play the point over. Hey, not bad. No. Too long. You lose. You lost again. But don't worry. I'm sure that with a little practice you're going to win. In any case, it's fantastic to play with someone who handles himself so well. Now, I'd like to show you my treasures. Look in my bag. Silver needle. Take it. I'll give it to you. That's my slingshot. It means a lot to me. Yes, I understand. I don't want to give it away, but I will trade for it. In exchange for what? I don't know. Some really precious treasure. I see you like music. I found that in the attic of a demolished house. I picked up these bright pebbles near a waterfall. This is Cardinal Felicio Briganti. This is Father Arno Moriani. So, your stay in Budapest. Instructive. But I must admit that Professor Boxoff's opinions are rather disturbing. Oh, that's alarming. I do hope that you intend to conclude the way we expect. Rest assured. I also spoke with Professor Kruger, who approached the problem in a very rational manner. I now have sufficient material to write my report. I'm starting tonight. Oh, you're always so dynamic. But try to get some rest afterwards. If you like Vladovista, stay there a while. Walk, read, pray, enjoy the calm and the silence. I'm going for a two-week retreat to a little monastery in Abruzzo. We'll see each other when I get back to Rome. Goodbye, Your Eminence. Be well, Arno. I worked late, I finished my report, and then I went to bed. It was hot and humid. Arno. Arno.
Another night of agitation. That's the third time I've dreamt of Maria. I'm attracted to that woman, it's obvious. Lord, preserve me from temptation. <laughs>